let's try to take a quick survey into interrelated drug discovery, uh, drug discovery and design. Um, I, I, will, I will give you uh, an overview of visual simulation, how visual simulation can help in general to solve some problems. And in particular, drug discovery. I know that we, we heard a number of how uh, the drug discovery or the model is used. But it, it, it's interesting to review that concept again. Um, so the presentation will try to stay at the very conceptual level, very few equations, um, because the important thing is. Concepts, and then you go into the program. So this is the program. Sooner or later, you learn. But the concepts, that's that's the, the, the real problem. People who do simulations, probably not all of you do simulations, computational simulations, but people who do simulations, the risk there is to become um, so the second is how can bilateral simulation aid drug discovery? Um, so stress which are the approximations that are involved? Um, and the, the range of validity. So why do I use what I use? And then we'll give a sense of what cannot be done. Uh, because some, some of you come from the biological slash biochemical world. And the biological world, unfortunately, is quite polarized. There are people who believe that nothing can be done with computers, so they are completely skeptical. And there are some people who believe that anything can be done. So they treat us who do simulation sort of a service unit. So can you do this? Um, no, this cannot be done. So they think that everything is possible that can be done, that can be done fast, and that we have to do it. So um, computational simulation can do many things that aid in many problems, but it's not a solution to every problem. So, this is a very, very, very broad uh, representation. So, in the real world, you have experiments. You do experiments, you get experimental data, then assume that that data is reliable, and you draw some conclusions. From with the real world problem, you can do the model. This is sort of an abstraction to a different degree. And you apply some computational methods. So the first thing that you have to do when you use or develop computational methods is you have to check how well your computational predictions match the real world. If your computational methods are successful, then you can use your computational methods to predict unknown properties or properties under different, well, under different conditions, for example. Uh, le le let's give you an example. Uh, computational simulation can be aided the prediction of properties which are difficult to determine experimentally. So, for example, modeling transmembrane, uh, transmembrane proteins such as GPCR, so they can be crystallized. So it's, it's a tedious and uh, slow process. Or you can study protein dynamics. Protein dynamics cannot, in general, cannot be determined just with experiments. 
they want to provide some insight into protein dynamics. But a computational simulation, if it's properly done, can give you the evolution in time of the system. Computational simulations are flexible to change the conditions of the system. So suppose, I don't know, that you're performing an experiment, whatever, at what atmosphere what pressure? Well, an experiment takes six months. Then you want to study how the system reacts at two atmosphere. It's a new, a new experiment, a new setup. So, <clears throat> For example, in drug discovery, you can study the protein with a non-native data. It goes that you crystallize one GPCR, which is very stable, hilarious, with one data. And now you want to see how that protein interacts with another data. Well, you have to go crystallize the protein again, uh, get the crystals, solve the structure. So it is very flexible for this. Then it could be fast. It could be cheap, but it's cheap compared to experiments. And um, it's, it could be quite fast. So it can be used in computer aided drug discovery. At, at a certain, at a, at a, a given stage in the long process of drug discovery. Uh, I'll, talk, I'll show you later on when uh, it's useful. And, well, computational simulation can bring some understanding of the microscopic behavior. So, sorry, the microscopic behavior in terms of the microscopic one. Well, a lot of dynamics is the case. You have a protein, you put water, you press the button, you run the simulation. You, after a a lot of simulation, you could get the thermodynamics of the, of the system. Or, perhaps, for example, you can try a quantum mechanical description of the bioelectron system. It's something that we, are, we have been doing since about four or five years. So, treating the whole system, the complete uh, protein, in quantum mechanical, in a quantum mechanical way. Uh, and always bear in mind that uh, simulations are a complement to experiments, not a substitute. Well, again, this, this, this is general, but I want to review this before going into discovery. Suppose that you have a system, and you want to study the system. So, at the simple level, what you insert the steps that you take. Well, if, if you're going to work with the protein and you're going to do structural based on discovery, for example, you need a structure. That's the first thing. It can be a tray, an MR, it could be a homologous project model. So what you need, in fact, is the identity and the positions of the atoms. Okay, so uh, for protein, you need, well, here I have an alanine, this atom and this atom are the this point of space and each atom has the, uh, the coordinates, x, y, z coordinates. Eventually the connectivity, so how atoms are connected. In proteins, that's not needed. If you say that you have an alanine, well, you know how the atoms of an alanine are connected. In reality, the atoms are connected in the same way. If you have a ligand, that's a different story. You have to say if the, the, the bond between two carbons is a single, double, or triple, for example. Once you have that, you have to choose how you are going to represent that system. That system can be represented in different ways. It can be, for example, represented by nuclei and electrons, and that's quantum mechanics. So you're going to solve the triangular equation. You can say, well, I know I'm going to represent the system uh, as uh, atoms. So in reality, it's a ball with certain parameters. Uh, you can uh, use related atoms, for example, 
CH3 of the carbon, the carbon with its hydrogen, becomes one part. Or you could do coarse grain, so you represent many particles with one bigger particle. Or, for example, potential energy mass. So you represent a protein with a mass, potential energy mass. Once you have that and connect it to item two, you have to determine the level of theory. If you're going to do quantum mechanics, well, it's different if you do uh, density functional theory, ab initio, semi empirical. If you're going to do modern mechanics, so for example, if you chose the all atom representation, well, you have to specify the force field. So, which force field are you going to do? The tense force And after you finish, I mean, you choose this, what you get is the potential energy function, which is a function of the coordinates of the atoms. Or, in uh, quantum mechanics, the coordinates of the nuclei and the atoms. Once you have this, you are almost done, you have to choose an algorithm to explore the potential energy surface. The system has an energy surface that depends on the coordinates of the atoms. And you think you, what you do in every problem is to explore that. In modern dynamics, you explore the, body, the potential energy surface in a way, in Monte Carlo you, ex you explore it in a different way, but that's basically what you do. So the molecular representation, well, you have the quantum mechanical representation that I think that um, uh, Ernesto showed the, the Schrodinger equation. We are not going to go into this. And you have the classical mechanical representation in which each atom is represented by a sphere with the mass, charge, and the radius. And the energy of the system is calculated in terms of these properties and atomic parameters and the distance, the progress distance between uh, particles. So this is a very general, very general uh, equation for the potential energy of a force field. There might be terms missing. There are some force fields that have, for example, an extra hydrogen bond term like EC. That, for example, um, uh, Cordelia uses and that we use. Uh, so, this is the Van der Waals term. It takes into account the distortion, interaction, and the Van der Waals repulsion. So, if, if you approach, if two atoms approach and approach at some point, they start repelling each other. That, that's it. That's it. it it's, it's, not, and it, it's not an electrostatic effect, it's a quantum effect. Uh, this is the electrostatic term, and this is the uh, bond stretching uh, uh, planar angle term and the torsional term. Always bear in mind that once, basically, you, you chose that, you, to choose that, you have to take into account this. So, which, which is the approach of going forward? Well, the approach depends on three things. Which is, first of all, which is the property of inverse? Are you going to calculate kingdom shifts? Or are you going to calculate binding free energy? Or you are just going to calculate uh, the modes of the ligand within the binding side? Then you have to determine which is the required accuracy. That's also Something important. So suppose that you, you want to determine how the ligand binds within a binding site. So you're trying to determine the pose. And you have a protein, let's say that you have a crystal structure at least uh, solid and two arms of solution. Well, your, the pose of your ligand, so the coordinates of the atoms of the ligand will have. You, you, you need them at one decimal point. So two point, two Armstrong. Zero point, two Armstrong. You don't need six decimal pieces for that. The, the atoms of the protein already have an error, which is 
residual key. So you, you, you have to, to specify that. Um, and then the computational power. So you, you, you may have a unit power, uh, for which you need very high accuracy. <coughs> but with your computational power, means that it will take you a year. You have to choose either to apply for more computing time, or you change your project. So let, let's go more in depth in computer-aided drug discovery. So that's a very, very behind the presentation of the drug discovery process. Let's start with the target discovery. So somebody has to tell you this target is important, is relevant. We assume the third person validated already that assessment. So he did a lot of experiments. And well, they have to use the program. So this kind of A is relevant in this study. Uh, so I believe that we block ATP binding to this protein kinase A, that that will have an impact in the proliferation uh, of cancer cells. So, well, what you just need is to find the molecule that binds to protein kinase A. It doesn't bind to other proteins, or if it binds, doesn't have any side effect that uh, have a good pharmacological and pharmacodynamic profile, and uh, well, and many things that are easy to enumerate but are very difficult to get. So at some point in the past, what pharma uh, companies did is well, they tried to they tried it on comp uh, compounds, and when they had a kid, they began optimizing the uh, kid. Before proteins in the circuit were available, that optimization was basically weak on the compound. I mean, it was a ligand based optimization. It was nothing else to do with overall chemical. We need to be um, with when when um, the structures became available. Well, now if you could model the ligand within the binding site, you could use that to guide your optimization. So they still continue using what was, uh, I mean, the screen of compounds. But now, well, they began more and more to use, uh, to take into account the interaction between the ligand and the protein at the structural level. <coughs> so the, once you, you have your target, what you need is to screen a chemical library. And after that, you get some hits. You see that the molecules finds the target uh, at 100 nanomoles. Well, this is an interesting thing. Now I'm going to optimize it. And you are here. Suppose that you optimize it and you get a beautiful molecule that finds at 1 nanomole. Um, it seems to have a good pharmacological profile. And that's excellent. But you have to test it. So you start your for clinical animal studies, then you go to clinical trials, and after 10 years and what happens in the tournament, you get the drug on the market. So as you see, this is a quite long process, it's very expensive, and it can fail at any point. So um, it can fail here. Last stage. So, when a company gets a failure at this three, imagine that probably they can spend eight hundred, nine hundred million dollars a year. So that's that's a problem. Uh, and in fact, in the last ten or twenty years, I mean, most most of the failures basically 
are, are, are here. Which again is the problem. So in this stage where you screen modules looking for things and you optimize them, well, here you can use computers to make the process faster, cheaper, and more rational. More rational means that uh, you basically avoid doing blind tests. If you try to uh, guide your search in a rational way. So let me first explain to you the concept of blocking. Computer aided practical is a very wide uh, area. There is some area of weaker things that is covering for try to get new kits from existing regions or you try to uh, optimize data for better data just based on existing data. I'm not going to go into that. I, I will try I will focus on uh, structure based like discovery and especially in um, docking based because you can do other stricter based methods like problem of course to the speaking. But basically this is perhaps the most representative. And if you understand this, it's not difficult to go to the others. So the, the, the concept of docking is in docking you predict the orientation and conformation of the molecules between the binary time. So you have a 3D right here, you have a 3D representation of the protein, what you have here as a mesh is represented by the design. This is certainly a nuclear receptor. I think that this protein is RSR, it makes you relevant. But um, so when you talk the molecule, what you get is the molecule talk. The molecule will be the binding side, which is here represented as sphere. And as a speed. So that's basically the end of it. Regardless of how you do it. <coughs> um, after you, you, you talk it, well, you, you would like to assess the binding reality. The binding reality is everything. So if you could have a method to accurately predict the binding reality of every one of the compounds. At, at chemical, uh, at chemical um, accuracy, you wouldn't need experiments. At least if you turn by an uh, Of course, what you can do here, especially if you, as you will see, if you do hyperbolic docking, is, well, it's, it's quite limited, but at least it's a go. So, the, the, the docking, in fact, what is, is an in silico binding experiment. So you are trying to reproduce the binding experiment in your computer. Here, so stop me if you have any, any questions. Right? So, <coughs> suppose that you have a target. That you know that protein X is a target and you have the structure. So, suppose also that you have a chemical library. If that library, if you have it, a physical chemical library, what you can do is what's called hyperbolic screening. So you screen a very fast way all of these compounds, and you get some hits for these. Of course, it's not error free. You're not doing a binding experiment. It's not that I do the biochemical assay. So you, you get some hits. Um, with some false um, positive, but you can do something else. You can do well. If I have the the, the the structure, I can try that docking that we we've seen here, but in a high throughput way. I can do it for all the libraries. Not the way. So 
eigenlease process and then just test the top scoring compound. Every time you do the docking work, you get an estimation of the quantum piano. If that's not fully accurate but acceptable, I can run the molecules by estimation of the binding free energy and just test the top scoring compound. When I say top scoring well, subject, it's not just that score, that binding free energy. There are many things to offer. We don't expect many of the data, which is quite handy. But if you do that and test, well, that selection, the selection of the compounds which are going, which are actually being uh, tested, is a rational selection. Just, you, 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 you don't just use brute force. Test everything. Just test select the compounds. Depends on your background. Uh, this, well, this, this review is a, it's a review that we wrote for four years ago about high throughput screening and high throughput uh, dog. It's a of the two uh, methods. Yeah, we have done performances. So let, let's go back to this high throughput dog. And let's represent it in a matricial way. So, suppose that you have the, the receptor and you have a library of n compounds. So, at the docking stage, what you do is you dock each of these compounds within the binding site. So, that's the growth of this matrix. So, you dock compound A, you get complex A. You dock compound B, you get complex A. And you do that for every compound. Once you have that, what you do now is you score the compound. That's the last row. This is the scoring and ranking. So now you score each compound in principle by binding to the end. If you do that in an accurate way, that's fine. That will give you the binding free energy of each compound, but of course you select the, one with, or the ones with less binding free energy. Life is not so easy in a way, so you get a score. But you rank these complexes by score, what, and what you are doing is you are ranking your compounds by score. The ones with best, better score are more likely to bind the target. So those are the ones that you are going to select or by evaluation. In fact, the score, well, th there are different ways to calculate the score. One is the plain bound evaluation that is not error free and has, uh, is not fully accurate. In many cases, we use this as an empirical score, which is a function. Uh, which is expressed as the sum of different com contributions. So it's a function that has a uh, contribution for ionic interactions, aromatic interactions, metals, hydrogen bond, whatever. There is no uh, unique or hundred uh, ends of scoring points. The reason that you do this and you don't use the clearly uh, So, well, what do you get? So, 
here, for example, is a way to represent what you get. This is a hydrope docking of the other means the other This is an actual. Actual is this one. So here, the, the, the molecules that you have on the x axis is formed, uh, and on the y axis, the mass. It's just the mass to separate the dots. This is the way to, to classify it. So the score, the uh, more negative, the better. Uh, this score, well, the units are, are units of the energy, but the range is not a range of the energy. So a molecule doesn't have minus 55 uh, take out the wall as the uh, G. Uh, it's just that, well, this empirical score sometimes, I mean, uh, that, I mean the, it, it doesn't correlate with finding if you're trying to do it, this kind of talking is to not to predict the defining reality of each compound. What you're trying to do is to separate your library into groups. The top, the best group, which, is the, which has the compounds which are more likely to bind than the rest. That, that's the goal of high of talking. It's not a prediction of finding reality of each compound. So here, for example, you have uh, well, the tree below, that is a known value of AR, which has a very good score. You have a testosterone that is also a very good binder, uh, also has a very good score. And well, for example, here you have a binder, which is far to the right. So if you do this and in a predictive way, what you would do is you say, well, I cut I mean, I take these 868 compounds to the left, and I analyze those. If you could have done that, you could have picked, like, make it alone that the hydrofresh was the one. You get predictive test. So, let's try to go more into that. Uh, structural basis for hydrotopic. So, what are the elements? What's the input? Well, you need a structure for the receptor. If you don't have that, you don't have a problem. I mean, it's a difficult problem. You have a problem. And uh, you have to represent the receptor somehow. Full atom, potential, uh, energy mass, degree, somehow. Once you define that, you need a chemical library. So you're going to do high proof. So you're going to do big data. These SDF mod tool are different formats of a chemical library. So a chemical library should contain information about every compound. So every molecule should be represented somehow. For example, you have to specify for it. The atoms, the identity of the atoms, the connectivity, and eventually the position. You could build the position. So if you know that, well, the molecule has atoms and the atoms in this way, you can start placing the atoms in the space and then you occupy like that. So you need a 3D representation of the compound also. Once you have that, what you do is a, a docking of every compound. So every compound gets a docking energy, which is slightly different than the core. The docking energy tries to determine which is the best conformation Scoring scores different figures. <coughs> so you keep the best or the best to work in the process of each figure, and then you take the best pose or best poses, and then you score. You calculate the score. Sometimes the score 
that the docking energy are the same. That usually the score is faster as the stirs. You are just trying to <coughs> determine the best confirmation for a single unit. Or the best confirmation, the best poses for a single ligand. So, again, docking energy discriminates confirmations of the same ligand. Docking scores discriminate different, among different ligands. So, what are the advantages and limitations of hydrogen docking? Well, first, it provides a rational approach. You at least, in theory, you have a, you have a uh, sound theoretical foundation to prefer one ligand to the other to be tested. The goal is to enrich the hitly with potential binder. The goal of hydrogen is not to discover every possible binder in the data. That's not the goal. On the other side, sometimes you do a hydrogen docking and you might select good compounds which are all inactive. What happened? Well, many things could have happened. One thing that could have happened is that there were no binders in the database. So if there are no binders in the database, the program will discover a binder, but there are none. If there are binders and they didn't show up, well, your protocol could be wrong, uh, you are giving a lot of uh, false negatives, whatever. What are the advantages? Well, speed is quite fast compared to by chemical acceleration, so that would be doing you know, ICP or one unit compounds, or, or even just one point to okay, testing the compound for the testing compound to find the acid for only one unit compound. It's low cost. I mean, once you have a you have the software that's it. Um, it provides a tentative bound structure. This is important. So at some point, you know, when you select a molecule and you test it and it's positive, uh, you have from the docking the bound structure. Well, in principle, tentative uh, bound structure, but you, you have a that very important for the optimization. And it's less biased towards existing chemotypes. This is different from ligand based. I mean, in ligand based, you have a ligand, and you try to find ligands similar to this one, which are also fine. Most likely, you will find some ligands. But the problem is that those ligands are very similar to the original ligands. In this case, the chemotypes might discover are more diverse. Limitation of hydrogen docking. Huh? Doing docking in a hydrogen way. The final energy prediction is usually poor. Again, you're not trying to predict the final energy, you're just trying to if you have a chemical library, you're trying to keep the top one percent and you want that one percent you want that you want that one percent to be enriched with potential binding. So that the probability of finding actual ligands in that one percent is much higher than finding ligands at random. Protein flexibility. Well why protein flexibility is a problem? Because when you do this screen, it has to be fast. <coughs> In fast, the first thing that you do is you consider that your protein is rigid, that the protein is not moving. 
In fact, in many cases, you go a step forward, and not only the receptor is rigid, but it's you, you replace your system by potential energy mass. Even if you don't do that, just keep the atoms. The problem is that it's rigid. Um, and in some cases, that's a problem. In some cases, it's a big problem. In the sense that you might miss a lot of potential labor. So the number of false negatives is very high due to neglecting chromium flexibility. So these papers are all about papers that uh, we publish about how to incorporate ways to incorporate <laughs> chromium flexibility in hydrogen. <clears throat> the other medium is the presence of waters. I mean, at some point, usually what you do when you're going to make a film, you remove all the water from the system. In many cases, that's the best approach, not in all cases. Because some objects are dry water, so some water you have to dig them, so that's the whole discussion. Um, also, the, the waters are dynamic. I, 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 I have dynamic systems on the field. I mean, going back and forth. And um, you might have a ligand which binds in any water in the binding site of ligand space. One water in the binding site and reproducing that dynamic is very difficult. The other problem, well, which is uh, also consequence of some of these, there are false positives and negatives. So there could be errors at the dropping state errors at the stage. Errors at the docking stage are not recovered, should not be recovered by the scoring stage. This is a representation of ligand RMSD versus run. So let me explain to you how this experiment was done. I selected four chromic kinases, which were about 29 X-ray structures. Each of these has a negative ligand. Uh, those ligands plus a set of decoys. Decoys mean uh, a decoy library is a library of molecules which are considered as non bundles so when you talk a molecule of ligands and decoys, what you would expect is that ligands get the best score, decoys get the worst score. That's the idea. That doesn't happen that way. So for each ligand, we assess the RMSD compared to the structure. That's easy. You plot the ligand, you compare how the ligand is stuck with the X-ray structure and the run of each ligand, because this ligand is locked with other ligands and decoys. So when you score them, you get a run. So those ligands get a run. They should be at the top. But that not always happen. So this is a representation of um, all the ligands, not only the 29. Here we have cross-docking. What do I mean? PKA has many structures. Each structure with a different liga. So you don't, all those ligands were all those structures. So you get about 120 points here. So what would you expect if the protocol and the program were perfect? You would expect all the ligands to be very well known and to be to have a very top run. So you can expect all the ligands here, in this area, or let's be generous, in this area. That's the idea. Suppose that somebody tells you what, the program is not ideal. What would be your next wish? Your next wish would be, well, if it's not ideal, I would like, Compound molecules, binders, that 
or his dog. That, that means that, that they were not dogged properly to have a bad one. I don't want the, my protocol to score well ligands that are in its place in the binding site. So you say, well, if everything is, is not here, I want the rest of the points to be here. So that means you dock the molecule, you miss the molecule, you get the back score. That's the idea, the second stage of ideality. This is the worst. These are molecules that are completely strong, but you get a very good score. You don't like that. Why? Because then it's not going to be transferable. You will get a lot of false positives when you do your predicted, predicted screen. And here are the molecules which are done properly, but they don't get a very good score, so they run poorly. So as you see, well, there are a lot of points here, a lot of points there, very few points here, which is good, and some points in this case, here. So that gives you the pictures to give you well, an idea of the relationship between docking and scoring stage. There are two stages, there are two different stages. Well, let, let me show a, a structure based um, problem with that example. This is a, something that we did uh, almost I mean, eight years ago. It is a very simple application of structure based drug discovery to the epidermal growth factor receptor in the There are hundreds of thousands of houses in the EFR. EGFRs and protein uh, kinase. Um, these are a big component. Uh, why we did this? We did this because in 2003 the crystal structure of EGFR appeared. So what we wanted to see if doing a kind of docking campaign, we could discover new so this was the first one. So um, so the input is a, a, a low protein structure. The, the PDB code is one of seventeen. This is GFR bound to a It's a low drug. The input was a set of three hundred and seventy K compounds, which after some filtering you uh, arrive with the What do we filter when we do avoid very small molecules, very big molecules, molecules that have a huge number of um, free uh, rotatable bonds? What's well, called the means rule of five. I think that there is a slide uh, later on. So, with this library and this PDB, we think for hand to docking, which is docking and scoring. What you think you, you get is a list of molecules and then a list of scores. We did post screening, inspection, I mean, uh, score cutoff, circle filters. We wanted the molecules to, for example, to make the character form with the region of the protein kinase, which is known that most of the protein kinases make a sulfate within the region. Specifically, the background of the hinge region and uh, the molecule. Then we did well, chemical clustering. You don't want to have your increase overrepresented molecules in the chemical clustering. So you group molecules that look similar and you keep one representative per cluster. Then, I mean, 1,000 oh, 1, compounds. Video inspection, yes. Video inspection of the One by one. I, I selected 50. They were purchased and evaluated. 
Well, the victim was selected. I think that's really the word. It is not that perfect. Because when you have a clinical library, then when you're going to purchase with a clinical vendor, they say, well, this is not available, this is not available. So I think that we purchased 20 or 30. Um, we got one molecule, which was an AP competitor, competitor and uh, which has an ICP of around 10 um, You will see why here we have these 30 and 32 in a moment. So 39 was a pretty decent compound in terms of activity to come from a way of screening uh, campaign. But we got also other molecules that were that exhibited anti-proliferative effect itself. So 39 was one of them, one of the basic ones in terms of anti-proliferative effects. But there were other two and th uh, 32 were even better. But when we tested two and 32 in a product chemical assay, it should have that it was not binding to EGFR. But it was showing anti-proliferative effects itself. So likely, for example, 2 and 32 were binding to some other kind of upstream or downstream. Uh, this is the binding mode. This is one of the things I was telling you that talking provides you with a tentative binding mode. Uh, our molecule is shown in yellow carbons and in white you have IRISA, which is the co-crystallized layer. You see here these uh, dots represent the hydrogen bond of the ligand with uh, a residue in the that's ending in 769. Um, with this OCI 744 is Iris. Well, we been this. This is a. I mean, this this, this slide is not a little bit. When you have a chemical library, you want to have one. Admitox profile. Admitox stands for absorption, so the product is the model common, absorbed properly, distributed, metabolism, spread properly, and you want the molecule to have zero toxicity. I mean, you don't want the molecule to be very potent that keeps your cancer cell, that keeps every cell in the body. So you want zero toxicity. So aggregate properties are related to many physical chemical properties, which basically are this. Are, you can try to predict some of these in silicon. Some are uh, determining eventually. Um, the Lipinski rule of five, Lipinski some years ago made a sort of statistic of uh, market drugs. Concluded that most of the drugs have very few violations, violations to these rules, which are <clears throat> less than five hydrogen bond donors, less than ten hydrogen bond acceptors, less than five hundred of the weight, less than five of C la P, so la P is the partition coefficient. That's your <coughs> How is the transfer between optimal and water? And it has less than, well, 10 torsions, free torsions, for a tangible bond. So, what's the, I mean, essentially, what's the problem of having a very, very flexible molecule as a drug that the very flexible molecule in the water is moving along, so it's flexible. Once it finds, Its mobility increases a lot. It gets stuck in the binding site. 
That means that the entropy increases because the number of existing states increases. So that means that the binary, <coughs> the highest contribution to the binary free energy is quite high. So we have an entropic energy with a very flexible model in bar. So that's why usually you want more to be hydrocastle as well. It's another problem. Isn't it? If you have a very flexible molecule, that molecule can bind many things. If you really read the molecule, you can only select on average, of course. Well, this is a lead optimization cycle which continues this. Uh, so suppose that you purchase your bioelectric community. Once you get a heat, you say, well, what can I do with my heat? Well, you want to. Optimize it so you have some active compounds. What would you ideally do if you could? Well, you you would co-crystallize your receptor with your best leads. That's it. Would be the best way to proceed. So you get a crystal complex, and then you continue. I mean, you optimize your ligand based on what you see on the crystal interaction of your active molecules and the receptor. Sometimes this is not possible. In most of the cases, it's not possible. We don't have a crystallographer next door. We are going to your molecules. Will you crystallize this for me? Sure, in here. That is what probably happens. So what you can do is an in silico ligand receptor complex. So what you take from the docking, or you can refine it, you can improve it certainly. You can do some long molecular dynamics in the elastic system, and then you come to the model. They're only a very good model. Good enough for the discovery. Once you have this, you do an in silico library design with the active compounds. So you have three active compounds. You try to design the library using those scaffolds. So you, you try to attach uh, substituents and build an in silico library. Now you want you would like to use some admixed filters. Right? You don't want you, you wouldn't want to include molecules which you know that at some point will have admixed problems. That means that that means that they will fail later on at a uh, certain uh, stage. So you here would like probably this library is not so big to do a more accurate binding free energy evaluation. Perhaps you could afford in this case. Some hundred rounds of whatever they have, so try to come up with some something uh, more accurate. You might cluster to a selection, chemical optimization, synthesis, and by evaluation. Perhaps you started with a 10 micromolar molecule, and now you move after one cycle, you are down to 500 nanomolar, a couple of cycles more, and you could be done. Well, <clears throat> I went through this yesterday. I won't show you too many details about the modeling. Um, let me tell you, this is a this was a modeling and a drug discovery project. So as I told you yesterday, the idea was uh, to work on uh, the melanin concentrating hormone one receptor. <coughs> we are well served. <coughs> so we did the modeling. We come up with um, the structural model. The goal of this data sphere modeling was uh, to develop a model with good quality enough for structural vector for screening, to predict even target interactions, and to be useful in mutagenesis experiments. We are not concerned about what the loop, if the answer is the way of doing, we, honestly, we don't care. We don't care because it's really. The first one is because we don't care. It's not important for our product. And second, because we could not do that at that time. So why bother with the things that we have not got? Because your tools are not good enough or your computing time is not enough. Um, so again, the limitation was it was not intended to model with high accuracy 
meet your spark from the spark itself. So it's good that when you have a uh, problem, you can uh, set the boundaries of your problem. So what do I want? I want to go here. I don't want to go I want I don't want to go here, so my method will use it for this in this case and not in this case. So well this is a summary of the whole product. So yesterday I showed you in this that with sequence alignments for complete no ligands, we generated an ensemble of ligand receptor complexes of the FCH. <coughs> so after some involved procedures, we came up with four binding side problems. So how could these models be validated? There's no crystal structure. If you have a crystal structure, you don't know models. So how can you validate? Well, yes, you can check if the ligand which was selected from the ligand steer process uh, made the proper contacts with the receptor. Yes. But after that, you end up with four models. How do, you, how do you choose a model? And how do you validate? So, the novelty here was that the binding site evaluation was done indirectly through small scale vehicle screening. So, what I said is this I have four models. Let's take the model that performs best in a small scale vehicle screen. How do I assess that? I take the library of ligands of MCH, I take the equal library, and I don't go. The, the binding side is showing the best performance of that doctor, so the binding side which recovers, which puts the most of the ligands at the top, I use that as a good model which is, well, this one. This is showing the enrichment of the topic. So on the x-axis, you have the screen database. On the y, you have the percentage of the recovery. So you, what you want is that your model recovers most of the ligands at the very top which is this model, the one which is here. So that model was selected and used now in a predictive vehicle screen to search for the compound. And we found six compounds below 20 micromolar among 129 compounds which were produced, which People who showed cloud told us was 11 times better than hydrogen screen. Is this the best way to validate? No, it's not. It's the best way to validate under this condition, and it is at that time. Well, we, we observed this yesterday. This was, for example, these were the two top hits, and these are docked within the binding site. As you see, the docking provides you with a detailed interaction between the ligand and the receptor. So, for example, this interaction that you see here between this aspartic on the screen and the charge A, that's characteristic of these and many GPCRs. So, well, of course, you filter that when you go here. Checking your ligands from within the binding site, you check that. Is this solid friend? If it's not friend, you discard it. That should be there. We saw also that uh, So to finish, <coughs> so what kind of field of use of the summary? 
to discover. So, well, for heat, discover. So heat is, you know, not, you know nothing, you have no layers, you have a door from the center, and you're trying to use complete tools to discover something, or something. So you serve within a chemical library, computational efficiency is solved. Yes, you have to be a large database. So the goal is to generate a smaller chemical sublibrary library enriched with potential binders. So there are many approaches here. Talking, this is the one that I focus on. Fragment based geo design. You are trying to build li uh, ligands, molecules, built from fragments. So you start talking for example fragments. And if a fragment talks well and another fragment talks well and the other fragment talks well, you have to link them. Which is it's very nice. But you have to take care of something that you can you could came up with the most beautiful molecule. And then you approach your chemistry and say, I have this or nice. It's impossible. I cannot do it. So you're stuck. So, um, uh, synthetic feasibility is an issue. Um, Form of a 4B screening, so <clears throat> it's another way to do shepherd based screening, which is the pharmacopose. you can uh, get pharmacopose, pharmacopose for your existing ligand or for your receptor at very too much, so you uh, have a Aromatic uh, interaction with the hydrogen bond and try to match your video and into that. Lead discovery. So, um, well, here in the kind of utilization. So, the, the, the chemical level is smaller. Now you have a key, you are trying to optimize, or kind of heat, heat in five minutes. No, 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 that. You are trying to optimize that. You are trying to build a library of many compounds, but not millions. You seek a more accurate prediction of the relative binding energy. You can afford that now. So which approach do you have? Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo is a way to sample, to explore the energy in hypersurface, molecular dynamics, quantum mechanics, free energy perturbation, thermodynamics and integration, different methods that are more sophisticated and take more time than just using an empirical score. For protein modeling, you can use computers. So you do Monte Carlo, whatever dynamics, and the hybridization as refined examples. You also want to study structural dynamics function. So, for example, simulation of in the receptor. Let me give you an example. With one receptor, that can act as a, um, suppose that it can act as an agonist and antagonist, an AR under the receptor. So, glutamine um, is an antagonist. But some patients, you know, I mean, the patient is getting a set of alanine, after which glutamine becomes an agonist. That because the mutation is within the binding site, it's uncertain. The size of the breast is quite similar. So, why is that happening? When you go to glutamide, the binding is an object. So, you can study that, for example, with molecular dynamics and try to understand why that mutation, so that change in structure, is having an impact in public. And probably is related to the dynamics, not just a matter of structure. Uh, again, Monte Carlo, Morgan Dynamics, quantum mechanics. This is just to be, because always, always the question is how many drugs were discovered with computer aid? So, uh, not all of them, some of them. <coughs> Somewhere, in, in some cases, structure-based methods or computer-aided drug methods help. 
this is just an example of uh, well, circuit based drug design. Uh, first, category from a pharmacopoeia based screening. Uh, no success in global design. The global design is like you make the molecule to go to scratch. So, in fact, computer aided drug discovery is computational chemistry in my own recipe. So, the, the advantage is that you get a physical insight of the system. Or you could get a physical insight of the system. And it's also a to be predictive. So, um, so which one should make it? The classical, to guide the development Oh, you see my acknowledgments as yesterday. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, we are in time. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I will be happy to ask them.